Our story begins with a man who held a common set of beliefs of the geography in which he lived. Ones that everyone in his whole country had held. All peoples of the earth knew that there were many deities that could be called upon for strength, for protection, for prosperity, and for fertility. The more enlightenment that you had, the more deities that you would be able to call upon. If you remember that the reason why that the Romans had come after the Christians in the way that they did was because the Christians only had one God and they couldn't figure it out because they had hundreds of gods that they were able to call upon but the Christian only had one. But this man, he knew that there was more than all of this. There was a God, one that he did not know who appeared to him and said, this is the covenant that I will make with you. He said, I will make you the father of many nations. He came and said, but what will you give me? I cannot be the father of many nations unless what you do is that you give me a son. So a son was born. And as this son was born, 21 years later, through a number of failures, mistakes, and challenges, as this son was born, now being 21, this God appeared unto him once again and said these words. He said, take your son. He said, your only son. And come and offer him to me as a burnt offering. Early the next morning, this man had gotten up and he packed the wood and the knife and he and his son traveled to a place for three days that was called Mount Moriah. It was a place that his God had now specified. As they neared the site, his son began to question him. He said, all of the things for the fire we have we have wood, we have kindling, we have a knife, and we have rope. But where is the lamb? Where is this lamb? And the father answered him with great faith and foresight and said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the offering, my son. Upon reaching this place, this place God had chosen, he demonstrates his obedience to faith by building an altar. He binds his son and lays his son upon this altar. And as he was at the very place of offering his son, something happened. But this now just so happens to be the place where most people misunderstand knowing God. Because they don't understand that if God gave me my son, why would God ever want me to offer my son? If God was the one who gave me this promise, he fulfilled this promise, why would he ever be the one that would ask me to sacrifice this very thing which I had waited so long in order to be able to receive? But before... This man could ever finish the offering. The angel of the Lord interrupted him from heaven and said to him, he said, Stop! Don't harm the boy. Then as he looked up from there in a thicket at that very moment, he saw this ram that was caught by his horns. He went over and he took the ram and sacrificed it, sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Then he, and all of us know who he was, his name was Abraham. Then Abraham named the place Jehovah Jireh. 
The idea of Jehovah Jireh is very interesting because people really believe that it means a number of different things. Many times what happens is people believe that Jehovah Jireh means that place over by Mount Moriah, that geography was where God called or Abram, Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh. Well, interestingly enough, I want to just pose a question to you. Why would he ever have to describe a place, a geography, being Jehovah Jireh? Because I'm presenting to you that the reason why that he used the term Jehovah Jireh at this particular point was not because of where he was on the outside of himself, but the place which Abraham had now achieved on the inside of himself. Very few individuals really can understand this, but it was that place inside of Abraham where he discovered that God would always provide. I could pick you out in the crowd today and I could actually ask questions one by one. I'll tell you what, I will do that. Cheryl, stand up. Come over here. Let me have a microphone, please. Come, sweetie. Now, Cheryl, you had breast cancer. That's what I said. I didn't say it. You're welcome. Never will have it again. As a matter of fact, it was only passing through. The English language, turn to it, Tori. Come up, come up here. The English language is a very interesting language. Because the English language, it becomes very possessive when we, here, sweetie, when, when the English language speaks, it speaks from a place of someone having something, such as when people have a cold, what they do is they say, I have a cold. They begin to possess the cold. It becomes they're cold. My people whose marriages don't work out, guess what it happens? It's my what? It's my divorce. You have a divorce. It's that you possess the spirit of divorce. That's how that spirit ends up going down into your children. That's what you have to watch out for. It's not what happens to you. It's what happens to everybody around you that you need to be careful over. But in a number of languages around the world, they are actually more um, passive. And then their passivity, the way that they explain it is this, that when the cancer would show up, it wasn't your cancer. It was a cancer that was passing through. But it was not yours. When poverty comes, it's not your poverty. It's a poverty that's passing through. The storms of life, you'll never stop. We see this in everything that Jesus talks about. The storms of life will, will, never, will never not come to a person's home. Jesus said that this will happen to every man, but one man has them passing through, and the other man actually possesses them. Now, speaking of Jehovah Jireh, and I'm probably going to ask you to talk with me next week as well, because next week I'm going to talk about Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. We are going to lay hands on everyone in the morning as well as in the evening of next week. But interestingly enough, um, when you first were directly spoken to about what your body was saying. And the doctors, all they did was kind of recognize and tell you what your body was saying. How did that make you feel? I was in shock. Yeah. Um, I was afraid. Yeah, yeah, I want to make sure you said that. I was afraid. <laughs> if you didn't, I was going to tell on you. Yes. <laughs> Yes. I'm telling on her, she, she was afraid. 
Yeah. Um, I, I guess I was just in complete shock. I didn't know what to think. I was so afraid. I, but, I, but then, what did you begin to exercise yourself in? Faith. And faith in what? God's word and what he said. Which part of God's word? The part where he said that he made me in his image and likeness and that I was fearfully and wonderfully made and that he was the Lord that healed me, Jehovah Rapha. So what you're saying then is that from everything that came to Cheryl on the outside was, was that you're going to die. This many percentage of people that have what you have, they don't ever kind of like wake up in the morning. And it's going to happen to you. But there is power in God's word. Yeah. There's not power in encouragement. Mm -mm. There's not power in conversation. There's not power in doctrinal arguments. But there was power in his word. <laughs> in his word. Yes. But you entered a place where all of a sudden you went from fear to a place of confidence. What happened? Um, well, now, folks, we did not rehearse this, no. okay? <laughs> um, Thursday night, I got the, the news, bad news. Chemo, mastectomy, the whole nine yards. Friday morning, I, well, I did not sleep the whole night. I was full of anxiety and fear. And <laughs> my phone started to ring. We need you to come for an MRI. We need to do a PET scan, a CAT scan. We got to get all this stuff going. And I was even like. even wanted you to bring your pets? Yeah. <laughs> and um, I, I said, oh, OK, well, this is what we have to do. This is what we have to do. Um, we had the MRI that day. My mom took me. And um, I was sitting in the chair. IV hooked up, shot up with Xanax, the whole, <laughs> everything, and... Uh, Might have been the best part of the whole experience. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, this was the best part of the whole experience. So all my clothes and everything is in a locker, locked up, and I could hear my phone bzz, buzzing, buzzing. And it was Pastor Rob. I didn't know that. So I go in for the MRI. Where is he? He's in the locker. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, I just, I, I tell you, I could not stand up straight. I, I felt like somebody had punched me. I, I walked around all day just like I was sick. And um, so I come out of the MRI, everything went fine, got dressed. I listened to my cell phone, it was Pastor Rob. And he said, I heard you had met an enemy. And he said, grab a hold of one scripture and you hold on to that scripture. He said, no weapon formed against you will prosper. You are healed by the stripes of Jesus. And I just remember I put my clothes on and I walked out of there standing tall. We went and got something to eat. And from that moment, I walked tall and I felt confident and that's what I did. I, I got a hold of a scripture and then two scriptures and three scriptures. And we just never looked back. And I never had any anxiety after that. I had great peace, anything they wanted to do, fine. I just, I trusted God's word, no matter what they said. I didn't listen to what they said. I, I couldn't. That was not the truth. But you were listening to something. You were listening to God's word. Yes. Not the doctor's words. No. No. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Let's give Cheryl a hand. Thank you, Stephen. And Abraham enters this place, the place that Cheryl just told you about. He enters this place where it doesn't really matter what it kind of looks to him as though that he needs to do. But what happens to him is, is that he now discovers that there is a place inside of God's promise where no matter what it seems as though that he needs to do, all of that actually means nothing in the face of what God had actually promised him. 
The book of Hebrews chapter 11, it even tells us concerning how Abraham looked at, during that particular moment that even if he had to go further than he went, the Bible said that he had also already received Isaac back in, in, in a, an image, in a figure, in a vision, in a dream. He had already received Isaac back to himself. He knew that God's promise actually was the thing that was going to bear true. And all that he ever did was exactly what Cheryl did. That there was a moment when what she did was she turned off what the doctors were saying. She turned off what her body was saying. She turned off the things that people wanted to have pity upon her over. And she turned on what God's promises were. That he was the Lord who had healed her. He had done something for her that goes far beyond anything that her body could speak. And Abraham discovered that place. It's that place where you no longer fight. It's the place where what you do is having had all the thoughts, all the difficulties, all the challenges in what you think, that you now come to a place to where you surrender. What am I surrendering? What am I surrendering to? Surrendering to. 39 years ago, at this particular time inside my life, I was in a mental institution. There were moments when I would have to spend time with wonderful, wonderful people. Wonderful Christian people. But yet at the same time, I couldn't listen to what they said. Linda and I would go somewhere and then as I, were, as, I, as I was in the middle of just having a wonderful conversation with someone, all the anxiety, all of the fear, all of the things that were the reason that put me behind that locked door would now return. When I looked into the scriptures, I became free. When I looked at people, I was bound all over again. So I discovered that if the only way that I could ever live was with my face in the book, I would rather know the book and be free. I may look like a freak to everyone else in the entire world, but my greatest friend was what he had promised. Abraham. He labored to enter into that rest, that place of rest for us. Let me try to give you a couple of things before, once again, Colonel Sanders begins to speak. <laughs> What's in a name? My friend sang that song all those years ago, What's in a Name? During Old Testament times, a name was not only identification, but it was an identity. Many times special meaning was attached to the name. Names had an explanatory purpose. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 25, it gives us the story of Nabal, how that Nabal actually became really disrespectful toward David as David and his men for three months had kept any of the scoundrels as well as the animals away from all of Nabal's flocks and herds. And what happened was, was that David just needed something to drink and some cakes of raisins. He sent some men over to be able to see Nabal and what Nabal did was he decided that he was going to be very disrespectful and what he did was he cut off half of people's beards. He cut a hole in their robe so that their rear end showed. And he sent those men back to David and he said, you tell that rebel. 
You tell that maggot that he has stolen Saul's kingdom. They got back to David with half of a beard and, and the backside cut out of their robes. And David f flies into f a furious rage. And when he flies into this furious rage, all of a sudden what happens is back at the camp, at Nabal's house, his wife Abigail hears concerning that Nabal had cut off half of those gentlemen's beards and sent them back. And when she heard that, the Bible said that she got upon the donkey. She told the other riders as she got all the wine, all the drinks that, she, that David wanted, all the cakes of raisins, everything that he was looking for. And what she did was she, she rode with great fury to get in front of David because David now was plotting how he was going to absolutely kill everything that had belonged to Nabal. She gets in front of David and she falls on her face. And she says, oh great king, in verse number 25, take a look at it. She said these words. She said, let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of the devil. Even Nabal, for his name is, as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your handmaiden, I did not even know that the young men came to us. Let me tell you what the word Nabal means. Nabal means a fool. Senseless. He's a failure. Nabal was the most successful failure that you find in all of the scriptures. She said, he is as his name is. He's senseless. David, he's senseless. I don't know why he did what he did, why he said what he said. David, David, don't. Don't do what you're thinking. Because this man is going to get his. But this blemish must never be upon Israel. Never. And he says these words. You are wiser than I. You stopped me from making the greatest mistake of my whole life. You stopped me. And in 10 days, Nabal dropped dead of a heart attack. In 10 days. You see, throughout the scriptures, God reveals himself to us through his names. Those names, friends, reveal the central personality and nature of the one who bears them. My question is, who is God to you? I think many times what happens is that we get caught in a place where what it is is that we tell everybody that we're a Christian. We tell everyone that we go to church. We tell people all of those things, but yet at the same time, that when we walk to the car, something happens. That no longer do we believe. No longer are we hooked up to who he really is. But do we... But do we actually... Embrace that. Now let me encourage you about that. Let me encourage you. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. I'm not correcting you. I'm showing you. So that you can begin to realize that there is a place It's not the place of being critical. It's not the place of pointing your finger. And it's not the place of compromise and lowering your standards so that everyone else will qualify. It's not one of those things at all. As a matter of fact, that there's a place where you begin to know God. 
The Apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesian church in Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 17. He said, for I pray for you that you would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you would know God better. I'm praying for you. You see, there was a place where Abraham pushed through, that he pressed in, a place where he wouldn't give up, a place where he wouldn't say, well, you know, I, I'm, you know, I believe in God because everybody believed in God. Everybody believed in Him. But yet at the same time, only one out of everyone believed Him. Abraham found that place and he called that place Jehovah Jireh. My place where I know that no matter that the rockets will red glare, the bombs will burst in air, it will give proof through the night that Jehovah Jireh is going to meet every one of your needs. No more fear. No more shame. No more worry. No more pain. Jehovah Jireh is going to meet your needs. Just the same way that Cheryl came to that place, where she stood up. She was no longer bowed over. She wasn't at a place where she was worried about what was about to happen to her. But she actually understood that although her body was going to go through all of that, yet at the same time, it was just passing through. My friend, circumstances pass through life. Problems pass through life. Difficulties pass through life, but never let it touch you. Never let it touch you. In the book of Psalms, let me give you a few things before I let you go. Who's your source, friends? Who is your source? Now, I didn't say that you didn't have a good job and you don't need a good job. But remember where we are. Never allow your job to be your source. Because the moment that your job becomes your source is the moment that the, when you lose your job, you'll think that God left you. You see, if you lose your job when God is your source, you didn't lose your source. You only lost your job. Say, God is my source. Not my job. Not my business, my God, surprised all my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Turn with me, please, to Psalm 121. In Psalm 121, I want to answer the question for you about who is your source. The psalmist actually, he said these words in verse 1. He said, I will look unto the law, to the hills, from whence cometh my strength. I will look unto the hills. You need to put a period there. I will look unto the hills. Now I'm quoting to you the King James. I understand the message is here. I'll get to that. I will look unto the hills, period. From whence cometh my strength? Question mark. My help doesn't come from the hills. My help doesn't come from the harvest. My help doesn't come from the bank. My help doesn't come from a wealthy relative. He said, my help comes from the name of who? Say it again. Say it again. Say it like you mean it. He said, who made heaven and earth? I'll look to the hills. Hey, that's got nothing for me. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the name of the who made heaven and earth for me. Psalm 121 verse 1, he said, I look up to the mountains. Does my strength come from mountains? No, my strength comes from God who made heaven and earth and mountains. He won't let you stumble. 
Your guardian won't fall asleep. Not on your life. Israel's garden will never doze nor sleep. God's your guardian. Right at your side to protect you. Shielding you from sunstroke. Sheltering you from moonstroke. You ought to look up moonstroke. It's pretty interesting. God guards you from every evil. He guards your very life. He guards you when you leave and when you return. He guards you now. He guards you always. Say, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh. is holding in trust, holding in trust. The, blessing the blessing I'm looking for. In, Psalm, or in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse number 8, the Bible says, The Lord shall command the blessing upon you in your bank. Say, God, God. will bless my bank account. Bless my bank account. In, the in the name of Jesus. Somebody said, well, you know, you can't. I'll tell you what, I don't know how you can ever get any money in your bank account if, in fact, you just don't go to work because that's where you see your source. Your source is not your bank account. God is your source regardless of who you are, where you are, and what you do. God is your source. But now remember, without working, you even don't believe that God is your source. Say, God, God is, my is my source. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse number 11, he said this, And the Lord shall make you plenteous in goods. Say, God shall make me plenteous in goods. Well, that's pretty interesting. Verse 12, he said, The Lord shall open unto you his good treasure. Say, The Lord will open unto me his good treasure. So I said, Well, you know, I don't really believe in prosperity. Don't worry about it. It's not going to come to your house. It's just, you don't need to be ever concerned. I don't believe in prosperity. Then why do you go to work? Oh, I know. Well, well, you know, well, I don't go to work. Well, that's really true. I have to go extra special. I've got to go double. I work till 3 o'clock in the morning. It's like Chantel mentioned one time. I said, well, well tell me about that. She said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. I said, well, you know, how are you going to do that? She said, well, it's all free. Well, you know how that fits with me. When somebody says it's free, guess what I said? There's nothing. Somebody's got to pay for it. Now, you might have found a way to get out of, to get out of paying for it. But somebody's going to pay for it. Somebody said, well, I got $300,000 worth of student loans, and they're just wiping them away. They didn't wipe them away. They pushed them in my column. <laughs> they didn't wipe them away. It ain't nothing. They're getting paid. You mean it's not free? Oh, no, it's not free. I'm telling you, you millennials are catching up. You're going to figure this out. I can hardly wait when I go, and then you guys are going to go, hey, hey, wait, where are you going? <laughs> I'm going to sit in the seat now. Let's go over one more thing. Go with me, please, to Psalm 91. And we'll close with this. Now, we're only closing because of who? Colonel who? That's why we're closing. Colonel Sanders. But just remember, 5 o'clock's another time. We have another time. Psalm 91. Let's stand as we say this to the Lord. When we recite God's word, we must always stand in his presence. By the way, service is not over just because you're standing. <laughs> Say this after me. 
I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And I live under the protection of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, You are my refuge and my fortress. My God, in you do I trust. He will deliver me from the hunter's net, from the destructive plague. See, this is where Ebola comes in. If you think that's over, that ain't over, darling. He will deliver me from the destructive plague. He will cover me with his feathers. And under his wings will I trust. Your faithfulness is a protective shield to me. I am not afraid of the terror of night. Nor of the arrows that fly by day. Nor the plagues that stalk in darkness. Or the epidemics that strike at noon. Though a thousand may fall at my side. Or ten thousand at my right hand. They will not come near me or mine. There shall no harm come to me. No plague will come near my home. For he has given his angels charge concerning me. To protect me in all my ways. They will support me with their hands so that I will not fall because I am lovingly devoted to my Father. He will deliver me. He will protect me because I know His name. He will rescue me and He will give me honor and with long life He will satisfy me and he will show me his salvation. Father, Father, thank you for being Jehovah Jireh to me. Let's give Jesus a shout, amen. Thank you, Jesus, glory to God. Thank you for being Jehovah Jireh, for meeting our needs in every way. Oh, we're so grateful. We're so grateful. We're so grateful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for meeting our needs. Thank you for meeting our needs. Thank you for taking care of our kids. Thank you, my Lord and my God. In the name of Jesus, we are so grateful. So grateful. So grateful. So grateful. So grateful. Say, I walk by faith and not by sight. I am a doer of the word and not a hearer only. I refuse to be deceived. Thank you, Father, that I put your words in my mouth and they will not depart from me. In Jesus' mighty name. Glory to God. You may be seated. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lord. We are grateful. Grateful, grateful, grateful. We're going to receive our seed to the Lord this morning. Father, we brought our tithe to you already. But now, Father, I thank you that my brothers and my sisters and myself, whether over the internet or in this room, that we, Father, today, we acknowledge you and we sow for the future. Thank you, Jesus. We so for our kids. For our businesses. For our jobs. May you give jobs to people, Father. May those that are job creators, may they make more money than they have any use for. May contracts come to them. May huge deposits be given to them. May they be flush with cash in every way. 
Why, my father? So that they can give jobs to your people who need them. In the name of Jesus. If you're making out a check, FHC is the way you do it. If you need an envelope for your cash giving, or you want to put that on a bank card, raise your hand or ushers will come by. They will get that for you. Also, if you're watching by the internet, please, just hit that box that says give today and come and sow your seed just as well. May God do something great for you. Last night I was watching Susie Orman on, on television and um, she went on and she was preparing for, preparing the people for 2015 and as you know, Susie is a just, um, she's a Christian uh, woman um, she doesn't, of course, tell anybody, but she said that I want to help prepare you for 2015. You need to make sure that your IRAs are in order. You need to make sure that you have a certain percentage that what you're going to do is that you're going to save. She said, but I want to tell you something that's more important, I consider, than anything else. And what she said was, I want you Already, before 2015 occurs, I want you to actually take a percentage of your income and I want you to start putting it out. Start giving it. Stop trying to save everything that you can and start giving everything that you can. She said, now is the time that we need open doors to come. We need to be able to have things coming back in our directions. We can't just go and put everything that we have away because then we're not putting anything out there to be multiplied. And I thought, Susie, what a sermon that you have. That was a great sermon. And welcome Erin as she comes. Come on, Erin. Thank you so much. God bless you guys. You're, you were awesome this morning. You did so good today. I'm so grateful that you, that you came. And we'll see you tonight, 5 o'clock. And remember, next Sunday morning, Jehovah what? Rapha, the Lord that heals you. Awesome. Aren't you glad you came to service this morning? Isn't that great? Well, hey, if you want this morning's CD, you can get it for just a dollar right across the hall from here, as well as... Just a reminder, if you're visiting for the first time, we do have a meet the pastor's brunch, hot breakfast, and our pastors are going to be there. They want to meet you, greet you, and tell you a little bit more about FHC. That is also right across the hall in the room. It says Guest Welcome Center, but that's where the meet the pastor's brunch is going to be. Um, as well as this, I don't know if you knew this, but you can subscribe to two podcasts that we have in the iTunes store. The first is Family Harvest Church. The second is Rob Thompson. So if you search either of those phrases, you can start downloading the podcast that we have. And last but not least, if you need prayer for anything, our ministry team is going to make their way to the front, and they're happy to pray with you and agree with you on anything that you need. God bless you guys. We'll see you tonight at 5 p.m.